Guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and in this video, we are throwing a review palooza. I have pulled 16 recent acquisitions from the Serial at Midnight archives. We're going to discuss them, review them here on the channel. I'm talking about new releases like Color Out of Space on 4K. I'm talking about Kino Lorber Studio Classics title from the current end of winter sale that's still running. I'm talking about Mill Creek's VHS Blu-rays. I'm even talking about some boutique label things that have have not shown up and probably never will show up in a retail store. But before we dive into, uh, we'll start with Color Out of Space. Before we dive into that, I just kind of wanted to give you a peek behind the scenes. But like, why? <laughs> why am I doing this? You know, I know as a YouTuber, as a content creator, because it's not just about YouTube, we have Serial at Midnight.com with tons of written content as well, breaking news, that sort of thing. As a content creator <laughs> on the internet, uh, I know that sometimes the pendulum can sometimes swing a little too far in the direction of just buying things, acquiring things. And uh, that is for a few different reasons. The first reason is because, let's face it, haul videos get a lot of views. Um, and in fact, they get a lot more views than review videos. So uh, that's I think that every YouTuber feels the temptation of that. You see those numbers, you see the audience show up to see what you picked up. We all want to see what other people are picking up. It's fun. Um, and the other reason for that is because, as I always like to say, we are living in the golden age of physical media. And I really do believe that. Yeah, sales are down in the mainstream market. Your Target and your Walmart has less than they used to. But the collector's market is on the rise. And there are more releases coming out than there ever have been dozens of releases every single week. There are weeks that have 50 to 60 releases in that week. Just because you're not seeing them at Target does not mean that they're not coming out. A lot of them are coming out from boutique labels like Severin, uh, Milk Creek Entertainment stuff, uh, Vinegar Syndrome, Kino Lorber, Dark Force Entertainment is where we were talking about a second ago. There's a lot of stuff that's happening kind of outside the, you know, that narrow focus of just retail stores. So uh, it's tempting to, to focus on that. And with all those releases coming out, we try to cover, we try to do the best we can to cover those. But if we're not talking about the stuff that we've already got, the things that we're picking up, if we're not reviewing them, what's the point of buying them in the first place? Just to stick them on a shelf and look at them and be like, I have that. Oh, what do you think about it? I don't know. I haven't watched it. That is not what we want to do. So this is an attempt, one, to kind of get caught up with these, these uh, releases, and two, just to, to have some substance because there's a lot of cool stuff and we have opinions about these. So we're going to kick that off with Color Out of Space. Now guys, before we get into this, I want to say this is an opinion-based video. This entire we got 16 opinions coming up. If you don't agree with an opinion that you hear on this channel, it's okay. You do not have to, like, don't get upset. Don't get mad. Don't leave angry comments. We all have different opinions. That's the thing about opinions is that none of them are right and none of them are wrong. They're all subjective. Their opinions are just just opinions. So I say all that to just say, uh, you know, also, I should also say like opinions can change. Like what I feel about a movie now might not be what I felt about it five years ago or will feel about it five years in the future. So it's very cool to kind of revisit things, but don't be bothered if, you know, if we don't necessarily see eye to eye on some of this stuff. So I prepare you uh, for our conversation about Color Out of Space. This is a an, an HP Lovecraft adaptation. H.P. Lovecraft was a contemporary of like a Robert E. Howard, 1920s, 1930s, uh, and he made, uh, he kind of gave us cosmic horror, the genre of cosmic horror, and uh, you know, Cthulhu is a Lovecraft creation. Arkham, the name Arkham, is pulled directly from H.P. Lovecraft's writings. That's uh, you know, Batman's Arkham Asylum, that is a direct tribute, a direct tip of the hat to H.P. Lovecraft. Cosmic horror is hard to do in visual form. So when something like this comes out, one, it's to be championed because not enough people are taking a crack at things like this. It's an intimidating genre and uh, it requires a lot. It's just very, very hard to do. And, and so... I'm really happy that this exists. I'm happy that this filmmaker has taken a chance. Richard Stanley has taken a chance on getting this out there. Uh, but I don't love this movie. I know a lot of YouTubers, a lot of people in the uh, <laughs> the media influencing uh, scene are really crazy about this. I am not one of them. I think that it's got a lot of cool things about it, which I guess I should focus on. So uh, again, kudos for a cosmic horror movie that really attempts to do something cool. Um, kudos for independent cinema, low budget cinema. You know, this is not a studio movie. This is not a, a 100 shoot, man. $100 million is low budget now. This is not a $350 million movie. This is a relatively low budget independent production. And uh, that's to be celebrated, right? But here's the thing. 
There's nothing in this movie that I don't feel like has been done better elsewhere by other directors. This movie stands on the shoulders of John Carpenter. It stands on the shoulders of David Cronenberg. Uh, if you like this movie and you're not very well versed in the film careers of either one of those directors, um, that w I would I would look into those guys because John Carpenter's The Thing alone um, is, is for me that's a perfect movie. You know, obviously spec <laughs> that's that's subjective, uh, but for me, John Carpenter's The Thing is about as good as it gets and it's got Lovecraft in it because his version of The Thing was a remake of a movie he loved when he was a kid called The Thing from Another World which is a 50s uh, science fiction horror movie it's on Blu-ray from Warner Archive that movie was directly influenced, influenced by the work of H.P. Lovecraft so Lovecraft to Think From Another World, to Carpenter, and maybe this is just the latest incarnation of that thing which is ripples on the same thing uh, but I think that the Carpenter movies are so much better. Uh, the, another problem that I have with this movie, th this is, it's very long. It's almost two hours. It's an hour and 50 minutes. And that doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but you guys, the source material, the, the, the little, the short story that this is based on, the Color Out of Space short story, I have an H.P. Lovecraft anthology. It's in there in my anthology book. 22 pages long and they've they've blown that thing up in this to almost two hours and it feels like it it really does it feels very stretched out very for me it drags out uh, and i know that listen the counter argument to that is well he's trying to set a baseline He's trying to show you what's you know, what the what normal is for this family before everything goes crazy. I get that. I just feel like it kind of lingers. Uh, it's just a, it's a little slow for me. Um, also, we got to talk about Nicolas Cage, you guys. I know I'm living in a world where, in the last few years, the cult of Nicolas Cage has developed. I'm not sure if it's because a new generation of film film fans has kind of risen up and discovered how crazy Nicolas Cage can be when he wants to be, but the cult of Nicolas Cage that worships and celebrates the bigger the bigger the performance, the most over-the-top performance, if he can chew as much scenery as possible, that's what they're interested in. That's the Nicolas Cage that shows up about halfway through this movie, and I don't like that Nicolas Cage. I like the, uh, I you know, I enjoy some of his wackier performances. I love Raising Arizona. I love um, Valley Girl as a great one, but he's also capable of tremendous subtlety. If you haven't seen Leaving Las Vegas, he's a fantastic actor, and he rarely does that anymore. Uh, so I don't, I, I'm not crazy about the huge, over-the-top Nicolas Cage performances just for the sake of, of doing that. You know, a, a lot of people are championing these huge performances, like Robert De Niro in the movie uh, Cape Fear. I know a lot of you guys think that is a fantastic performance. I don't, I don't care for that. That Scorsese version of that movie, I feel like, loses all of the subtlety that exists in the original because the Cape Fear, Scorsese's Cape Fear, is a remake. The the original has Robert Mitchum in that role and he is quiet. He is subdued. He's internal and that is explosive because when someone's screaming and yelling all over the place, you don't really need to pay much attention to him because you, you know that's what you're getting. But when someone is quiet and it's all going on in here and you don't know what's coming next, that's when you need to be worried. That's dangerous. Uh, and so this this is, uh, you know, it's it, I don't dislike this movie. I want to say that. I do not dislike this movie. I appreciate it for what it is, but um, I don't like it nearly as much as so many other YouTubers and content creators on the internet seem to uh, seem to have connected with it. But, you know, times change, opinions change. Maybe I'll revisit it down the line and I'll have a much different reaction. At the end of the day, I champion it because it's an independent movie, new voices, new new ideas, bold um, ambition, you know, there's a lot to, to be to be thankful for there. At the end of the day, though, it just doesn't work like I wish that it did for me. Moving on to <laughs> Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, my feelings about Quentin Tarantino are well, well, well represented here on the channel. Uh, he often, I mean, I love the guy's taste, I love his sensibilities. I think sometimes I get bothered because he, we've had the conversation here. There's a video about my conflict with Quentin Tarantino. If I remember it, I'll link it right here. But uh, the, at the end of the day, what it is, is that he and I like a lot of the same stuff. A lot of the stuff that I enjoy ends up in his movies. I'm watching Mannix right now. I go to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. There's Mannix in the TV show or in the movie. He's got the TV show on in the movie. So but the music that I listen to shows up in his movies. We seem to be drawing from a lot of the same interests, but... I don't know, maybe there's jealousy there too. It's that remix thing, you know, the idea of like uh, sampling. Let's call it sampling. Because we we got comments about that in our Quentin Tarantino video. Like, how do you feel about sampling when an artist takes another person's work and they just add to it or embellish it? And like, 
I think it's fine as long as you acknowledge that you're sampling something, as long as you acknowledge the source. And for most of Quentin Tarantino's career, he hasn't really. He just kind of, and listen, this is a whole separate conversation. Is it his job to show you where he got these influences? No, probably not. But when I watch, you know, a 50s movie and I'm like, oh, oh, I thought Quentin Tarantino invented that for such and such movie. I thought that line of dialogue was his. And then you find out it's not. He just took it from something. Uh, that That's the thing that kind of diminishes it for me. But having said all of that, if you saw a review for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I adore this movie. I lo- This is my favorite thing he's ever done. I'm all in. Uh, this is a great look of 4K Blu-ray. It's a little dark. Uh, the Blu-ray actually has, I think it has better color timing, but I, I guess they wanted it to be darker. I'm not sure why. I'm not exactly sure about that, but it's clearly what they were going for because they, you know, it's not a mistake. <laughs> They've graded it the way they want it to be seen. And for me, it's a little dark, but uh, you know, I, I really responded well to this movie because it's every in- just so many of my interests, so many of my own cultural interests wrapped up in this movie. And, uh, you know, there's rumors of a 4K, I'm sorry, not a 4K, a four hour version of this movie. I- I'm all in. Sign me up for that. I, I would watch that in a minute. I- longer, six hours. Give me an eight hour version. You guys listen to uh, the Movies That Made Me podcast with uh, Josh Olson and Joe Dante. You know, Joe Dante, uh, the Gremlins and the Burbs. A great director. He's on a podcast and he's got great movie knowledge, loves a lot of the same stuff that I do. Um, but uh, he, uh, they were talking to Ileana Douglas, who's an actor. She's in a ton of stuff. She has her own podcast. Ileana Douglas was talking about Martin Scorsese, who's a friend of her. She just calls him Marty. And she's talking about how uh, the Irishman, you know, the Irishman is like really long. And she was like, you know, but the thing about Marty is that he would have that movie be 12 hours because for him, he would rather exist in the reality of a movie than in actual reality. He just wants to live inside the movie. And I don't, I'm telling you guys, this is me now. I don't really feel that way about much of anything. See conversation about color out of space. I think it's too long. But when I'm all in on something like this, like I would watch a 12 hour cut of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood like that. (laughs) I want it. Bring it on. Just let me live in 1969 Los Angeles. Let me absorb the architecture and the music and the atmosphere. This is my jam. So, uh, uh, a big fan of that movie. Another relatively recent release. It's not super new, but I just caught up with it. This is Detective Pikachu. I am not of the Pokemon generation. I'm, I was too old for Pokemon. Uh, I think I was in early college when Pokemon first kind of hit in the mid to late 90s. If not, if not college, it was later in high school. But I was, it wasn't anything that my peer group was into. So I, to this day, I mean, even after, after having seen this movie, I can really only name you Pikachu. I don't really know any of the other Pokemon characters. Um, but uh, I go into this movie relatively blind. Ryan Reynolds is a big attraction for me because I think he's pretty great. And uh, I like this movie. It, it's it's a great example of a big budget movie by a committee for a mass audience that hasn't sold its soul. Like it feels sweet and kind of affirming and kind of positive and uplifting while still being, you know, a, a mass consumed product. I, I think the Sonic movie, I, I talked about this in my review of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. It kind of reminded me of Detective Pikachu. Uh, I enjoy this. I don't see myself going back to it a lot, but for what it is, uh, I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure for you guys who have grown up with Pokemon, it's probably, you know, even better because you have that emotional, nostalgic connection with it. Ford v. Ferrari, this is the Best Buy exclusive steelbook. We actually did an unboxing of this on uh, for, our, for Patreon as soon as like the day this came out, This because it's gorgeous, and it was selling like hotcakes. We did an unboxing on Patreon. You know, I don't talk a lot about Patreon here on the channel, but we do a t- if you like videos like this, long-form, opinionated, just kind of uh, free-flowing, um, not quick hits. If you like those deeper videos, we have hours upon hours upon hours of that stuff on Patreon. Uh, the Collecting at Midnight series, you know, we did three episodes of Collecting at Midnight here on uh, on YouTube. And then it moved over to Patreon. There, We just wrapped up uh, serial, uh, Collecting at Midnight episode nine. Number 10 is on the way. So, uh, what's that? Seven, six to seven hours of Patreon exclusive Collecting at Midnight videos just right there. And then all our collection tours. People ask all the time, do you ever do collection tours? We do. We do a one hour tour. Not every month, but most months on Patreon, we just spend an hour going through a different section of the collection, item by item, talking it like this, talking about what the stuff means and what we think about it, comics, music, movies. Uh, I don't bring up the Patreon stuff often, but I will tell you, if you don't support us, please support the creators that you care about because 
Um, YouTube is hard. It takes a lot of work. For every video that you see on here on the channel, there's a minimum of three hours involved in it, if not five, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes more than that. I'll give you a, a peek behind the scenes. This is the second pass on this video. There was one pass already. It was almost an hour long and it was unusable. So uh, there are many hours in these YouTube videos and this is not my job. This is something I do in my free time. I would love to make this my job, but without support, there's just no way that's going to happen. So if you care about, you know, for the people that you do care about, the content creators that you do care about, that you agree with, that you want to see grow and thrive, um, throw them a buck or two bucks or, you know, our maximum level on Patreon is seven dollars and that gets you all of our exclusive videos all our behind the scenes tours collecting at midnight our audio commentaries there's a bunch of about we try to put our audio commentary sometimes here on the youtube channel but not all of them for sure there's a lot of audio commentaries only on patreon as well as you know for our top tier which is seven bucks again I, I, we tried to price it as low as we could so that more people we wanted everybody to be a part of it we thought everybody can ship in seven bucks um and if you can i understand but uh, that gets you uh, a, a live stream, you know, exclusive live stream every single month. So uh, we, you know, we're doing our best to um, to uh, to give you the maximum. <laughs> we're, we're very active, as I guess what I'm trying to say. We do our best. So we did do an unboxing video for this on Patreon. I love this movie. I saw this in theaters in IMAX. It was one of my top five movies of the year. It's uh, of 2019 now. It still is. I still adore this movie. I think again, it's a little long. I. Uh, Movies are getting longer. That's not a speculation. That's a fact. And I think that's because um, they're really trying to push the value, push the experience. And I, I also notice a divide that younger people like longer movies. The older you get, the shorter you want them because you want to get more in. Um, and I think that's just age. I think that's and I was not necessarily wisdom. I think maybe experience and you just realize like your time is shorter. You've got more to do. Uh, and maybe we'll revisit that further further down in the stack because there's a lot of movies that I think that's just too long. This is too long. I don't want to sit there for three hours or for two and a half hours. Uh, I could shave 30 minutes off a of Ford v Ferrari. I would actually end the movie earlier than where it does end. But um, I think that uh, when you're dealing with historical people, because this is based on a true story, you have to serve reality as well as the story you're trying story that you're trying to tell. And uh, I, I really, really, really love this movie. I love the music. You know, my joke is that I, I say it every time I get a chance. My joke is that you can judge the quality of a movie by how many times they play Polk Salad Annie in that movie. You know, this, Elvis did a song called Polk Salad Annie. I think Jerry Reed wrote that, maybe. Don't quote me. But uh, Ford v Ferrari plays Polk Salad Annie three times. So high quality indeed. Uh, moving on, let's. Oh, we're getting into the Kino Lorber Studio Classics Hall. She. You guys, this movie is bonkers. This is a 1984 post-apocalyptic version of the L. Ryder Haggard novel. I, you know, it's, it's from like the 1800s. I want to say it's like the 1880s or something like that. And there is an adaptation of, uh, of, of She. The story is called She. H. Ryder Haggard also wrote, or L. Ryder Haggard. Hold on. I'm now, <laughs> L. Ryder Haggard. Haggard also wrote uh, King Solomon's Minds, which has been adapted several times. Uh, but I think she is actually more popular than that one. But the story, you know, the, the Hammer, there's a Hammer version of the movie from 1965, I want to say. It's got Peter Cushing. It's got Christopher Lee. Gandalf, you will not take the Palantir, Gandalf. You may fire when ready. It's my Cushing and Christopher Lee all rolled into one. You are welcome. Uh, it's a Hammer movie, and it's relatively, I think, I've never read the book. I think it's relatively faithful to the source. These guys in, like, Africa, and they stumble upon this tribe. They're worshiping the goddess She. She has a secret, and this is a post-apocalyptic version of that that takes great liberties with that story. It's really just an excuse to go nuts, and I, 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 I'm, I'm a fan. Don't get me wrong. Like, everything that they're going for in this movie, I'm on board with. It's, it's kind of like Mad Max with swords in 1984 so it's heavy metal it's, got, it's a heavy metal post-apocalyptic sword and sorcery movie because there is magic in this movie um and uh, I, I i don't even want to know i don't know how much i want to tell you but there's an interview with the writer and director all these kino discs have 
pretty great extras on him. There's an interview with the writer and director, and he knew exactly what he was making. Like, he talks about the movie, and he was like, you know, I wanted to make a pro-woman, tough woman. There's a lot of women in the movie. They're in a lot of positions of power, but they're also in a lot of, like, not a lot of clothes and a lot of, like, metal bikinis and stuff like that. Here, this, this is very representative of the movie, these screenshots. Very representative. Uh, it stars Sandal Bergman, who was in Conan the Barbarian. She was in Red Sonja. She was a dancer for Bob Fosse. She's a very talented dancer. Um, and this is like her movie. This comes between Conan and uh, and Red Sonja. And this is like her movie. She's the lead. She is she. And, you know, kind of the same premise, but there's really no plot to speak of. It's just like vignettes. It's like, uh, oh, this is the scene where they go to cross the bridge and there's the guy that can clone himself when he's maimed. If he gets an arm cut off, he can regenerate a whole new body from that arm, salamander style. And he also does celebrity impressions for the people that are trying to cross the bridge. What? What? Oh, and then there's the scene where Sandal Bergman goes down into this uh, into this dungeon, and she has to fight all the people that pop out of the boxes. But they don't pop out of boxes like all at the same time. They kind of wait, and each box is worse than the other one. What? What in the world? That's the kind of movie this is. It's just kind of like stream of consciousness, very surreal. But that's what he was trying to do. You know, so often we assume that we are smarter than the movies that we're watching, and uh, we should not. I, I don't think that's a great a great stance to have. I think we should embrace so, so often movies want you to have fun with them, not at their expense. This is a movie. It's very kitschy. It's very campy. It's very quirky. It's very surreal, but it's deliberately so. And it's better to have fun with the movie instead of at the movie, if that makes any sense. Uh, Cause the director's talking about it. He's like, you know, I just wanted to have a surreal experience with all this different imagery. You know, so often we're so literal now we're so intense and we're so literal and just looking to be upset by things. And now I can see people being like, well, why would you go down into the, dungeon in the first place and then why would the people in the boxes not pop out all at the same time so that they could all kill her and then instead so they wait their turn they take turns until the ones before them are dead and then they pop out it, sometimes a movie is just a movie sometimes a scene with a woman fighting people that pop out of boxes is just a movie about a woman fighting people that pop out of boxes it's a visual it's just supposed to be fun to look at we're like wow it's like heavy metal magazine or heavy metal the movie so i don't know i had a lot of fun with this it's not a great movie by any means but it's um it's crazy, and I champion originality. I love the weird, wonderful corners of cinema. That's what I'm really looking for, is things like this. Things that uh, don't feel like everything else at the movies. You know, things that don't feel homogenized, made by a committee. Things that feel like they're made by a person, and it's okay if that person's a little kooky. Uh, so, I don't know, I had a lot of fun with this. It really, it doesn't necessarily, like, listen, I'm grateful that Kino Lorber has put this out. It feels like something like Severin would have been after, or Vinegar Syndrome, or somebody like that. It's an, I think it's independent. I I don't remember seeing him. It's 20th Century Fox and MGM, so I guess they picked up the distribution for that. Uh, but um, so I, I mean, I don't know. But it feels like if I feel like if Severn had put this out or somebody like that had put this out, this would be on the top of everybody's list. They'd be like, "Oh, guys, she is amazing." All right, let's talk about uh, the Get Smart movie, The Nude Bombs. This is a 1980. Uh, it's the movie version of Get Smart. But here's the thing: you're, if you're thinking about the Steve Carell movie that came out like you know 2000 whatever erase that from your head and just get rid of that memory uh, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind style get smart was a 1960s i think it ran for five seasons between 65 and 1970 starred don adams as agent maxwell smart it was a spoof of the spy movie cycle that was going on in the mid 60s co-created co-created with by mel brooks <laughs> the great mel brooks and buck henry who just recently passed away but if you know mel brooks's sense of humor that silly silly sense of humor it's all over this movie <laughs> there, there's a scene where the, like the bad guy's lair is inside this like volcano mountain kind of a thing and they have to figure out a way to get into the mountain and there's a zipper on the side of the mountain it's like a 20 foot tall zipper and like the size of the zipper itself you know like the thing you pull is like this big and like you just like it zips up and you just walk through. It's just, it's silly. It's meant to be fun, right? It's just goofy, goofy, goofy jokes. A lot of crotch jokes. Um, but here's the thing: it's not like it's not a great representation of Get Smart. It's its own thing. It's like a it's like an echo of uh, of Get Smart. And it some of it works and some of it doesn't. It's not great, but it's solid. It doesn't really feel. 
the, you know, we were talking a second ago about like corporate made things. This movie, it has a ton of special features on here, including a, uh, an audio commentary by the creator of Sledgehammer, the 80s camp classic. Uh, you think like Naked Gun or uh, the, the, the Police Squad. You also think about Sledgehammer. So many of us do. Alan Spencer created that show. And Alan Spencer was responsible. Like Don Adams called him to come in and kind of work on the script, submit jokes, because he knew it wasn't really working. He knew it was it's kind of... <laughs> I don't want to say it was a turkey. He just knew it needed help. It wasn't where it needed to be. So in comes um, Alan Spencer, and he's working on this this story. And he now has a, there's a Trailers from Hell on here. Uh, Joe Dante's Trailers from Hell. I think it's trailersfromhell.com. Uh, second Joe Dante reference in this video. So he's talking about like he worked on this movie and how it was kind of just cynically created by this corporation because like, well, the Get Smart brand has brand recognition. We're not going to invite the co-star. You know, there was a female agent that was the co-star of the entire series. We're not going to invite her back. This isn't your daddy's Get Smart, but we want the brand recognition. And that's what we see. That's why the Get Smart movie with Steve Carell exists. That's why they're making an Indiana Jones that Spielberg is apparently not going to direct and Indiana Jones is going to be like 78 years old. Do we want that? It's just it echoes. It's just, well, it has a brand recognition. That's a product. We can get some money off of it. Questions that are important to ask. This was born out of that mentality. But despite all of that, it, it's still pretty enjoyable. It's got some very uh, some very funny gags. It's got some beautiful women, some beautiful 70s women. The... Um, I can't remember the actress's name, but she was in, uh, she was like the, the, the princes and Buck Rogers, specifically like season two, I believe. Uh, she was in, um, uh, some episodes of Matt Houston, I believe. Anyway, it's, it's, it's really, it's, oh, Emmanuel, the actress that played, those of you who know Emmanuel know exactly what I'm talking about. Like she's in here. Uh, and it's got, it's just got some really cool stuff in here, but it is not the purest form of get smart. The best get smart is the OG get smart from the sixties. Um, also I think we mentioned this in the Kino Lorber hall video that we did, but, uh, uh, Don Adams is the voice of inspector gadget. And if you grew up loving inspector gadget, that's essentially the Maxwell smart character, but with like gadgets, it's the same, it's his shtick. That's what he did. It's like missed it by that much. That's, that's his thing. All right, you guys, Sunny and Share Good Times. I bought this on a lark. I bought this because it was on sale. I, I've noticed it before and just been like, hmm, I don't know. See, I, I know Sunny and Share. I know the music. I know, like, I got you, babe, and the beat goes on, which I've seen, like, they've reworked the lyrics and it's in a prescription drug commercial on TV. I don't like that. That's not good. But they, they couldn't have done it without permission to do it. So, welcome to the modern world. Uh, but so I, like, I didn't grow up with a Sonny and Cher television. Like, I don't know the television show. I don't think I've ever seen a single episode of the TV series. So I don't have a whole lot of exposure to Sonny and Cher, but you guys know I love 60s culture. I love 60s music. I adored this movie. I adored this movie. I've actually watched it twice. It's one of these things where, okay, let's start here. It's directed by William Friedkin. Oh Yeah. That William Friedkin. I'm talking about the director of The Exorcist, the director of The French Connection. And this is not, this was his first movie. Well, it's, he did documentaries. It's his first feature film. And this is not some movie that he's like, uh, I don't want to talk about it. It was a long time ago. He, there's a new interview with him on this movie. This has been rescanned, the, a 4K scan from the original camera negative. And they got like an 18 minute interview with Friedkin talking about this movie. And he's still proud of it. Good on you, William Friedkin. You should be proud of this movie. He was friends with Sonny Bono until the day that Sonny died in 1998 right he that terrible skiing accident anyway this is i was just so, listen it's it's just fun it's that look at me i'm wearing a batman a 1966 batman shirt i'm talking about camp i'm talking about kitsch i'm championing she because it's weird i appreciate the fringes the weird is wonderful and uh, this movie is weird the whole premise is like they've been they're, they're successful, they're a pop music act, as they were in the 60s, and they've been given the opportunity to make a movie, but the studio wants to make a movie. Look at that. Studio wants to make a movie, but they don't have a plot. So in the process of trying to come up with a plot, Sonny's kind of brain scheming all these. He, he does like, he has a Western fantasy, and he has a gangster fantasy, and he has a Tarzan fantasy. 
and at the end of the day, that is the movie that we're watching. And they kind of said, well, I'm not going to spoil it. But that's the movie. It's just these weird, kitschy fantasies. And I love that stuff. I think that stuff is absolutely wonderful. And I got to tell you, like, I have known who Cher is for my entire life. I remember watching, if I could turn back time as a, you know, like as a 10-year-old and being like, this makes me feel funny. And, but, but here I am, an adult, and like I have not seen Cher. I have I have known about Cher. I've been aware of Cher. But 60s Cher, Cher, I see you. You are amazing. Cher is a goddess, you guys. Cher is a, oh, Cher is a goddess. That's the that's that's all there is to say. I have rediscovered, I really just discovered for the first time the uh, the the wonderful sense of humor and the wonderful sense of fun. Listen, I'm probably going to get into the variety show. I'm probably going to get into the music. Sunny and Cher rabbit hole coming up. And it's because of this movie. Now listen, your mileage might vary from mine. You might not. We all have, as, as mentioned at the beginning of this video, we all have different opinions. We're all looking for different things. I'm looking for weird, wonderful, but also kind of sincere and affirming and things that kind of make me feel better and because you know there's there's this darkness all the time right and i'm trying to try and try because you want a tarantino reference i'm trying real hard to be the shepherd I'm trying real hard to be the shepherd and movies like this helps me to be the shepherd and it makes me happy and i want to chase that happiness so all that goes to say big fan of good times okay Midas Run. Guys, this is kind of the bummer of the whole Kino Lorber Hall that I got so far. And it's not that it's a bad movie, it just doesn't really come together like it needs to. And I'm not sure why. I've seen a lot of, like, when it didn't work for me, I went to the internet and I was reading other reviews. It doesn't seem to work for a lot of people. And I think at the end of the day, maybe it's the director. I'm not sure it's the cast. It's got a great cast. Cesar Romero, you know, the, the, the Joker. Um, it's got uh, Fred Astaire. And the, who's like, well, Fred Astaire, you know, he's not that great. Um, Richard Crenna may be the weak element for me. I think maybe he's just miscast. I don't think of Richard Crenna as like the likable lead man. I think of him as like the tough guy. And he's even like, he's like this romantic, he's, so he's the romantic lead in this movie. He's kind of like a pacifist. I'm like, that's not Richard Crenna. Nobody buys him as a pacifist. This actress, Anne Haywood, I'm not familiar with her outside of this. I don't know that I've seen her in anything else, but she's pretty great. She's very beautiful. And she's got this like really 60s exotic quality. It doesn't really show up on the cover here. Maybe a little bit in the shot on the back, but she's she's got the, I don't know, it's like this European otherworldliness, that Sophia Loren kind of a thing. She's not not on the same level as Sophia Loren, but she's pretty pretty um, pretty engaging and, and charismatic. But something about it, I just it feels dull. It routinely feels dull, and I should be more invested in what I'm seeing than I actually am. Uh, and that's not a good sign for a, for a movie. So it's fine. Maybe I will revisit it later down the road and find more to like about it now that that first viewing is out of the way and I didn't really love it. Um, could see it for the movie that it is and not the movie I wanted it to be. There's something to be said for that. But I don't know. It was it was fine, but um, hard to recommend. All right, we got two more Kino Lorber classics, title studio classics. This is The Gun Runners. This is a uh, it's an adaptation of an Ernest, Ernest Hemingway story. I believe this was previously adapted. I think Key Largo is adapted from the same story. See, I've never read the story, the Ernest Hemingway story, so I can't be too sure about that. But I think I read that Key Largo, the Bogart classic, Key Largo, I think it's the same source material. Anyway, Audie Murphy, I think this is a loose telling anyway. So Audie Murphy, who we've talked about in the Hall video, he was a war hero. Uh, he, um, you know, he... Tarantino reference. Ding the bell, Tarantino reference. In Inglorious Bastards, the sniper, the German sniper that kills all the people and then gets the movie career because of like the story about his life. That is a German version of Audie Murphy. That entire subplot is a tribute to Audie Murphy from Quentin Tarantino because Audie Murphy's pretty great. Uh, he was a legitimate World War II hero. He survived for quite a while like with just his rifle um, sniping people and surviving for, you know, all by himself. And he came back a war hero. They threw a movie career at him. He's not a great actor, but he was a legitimate boy hero. Like, boy. He was a legitimate young World War II hero. Here's the thing. This movie comes out in 1958. He's no longer a boy. He's in his 30s. I'm not even sure exactly how old he was in this movie. But because he's not a great actor, it's hard for him to hold this one down. But I'll tell you who does hold it down, and that is Eddie Albert. Uh, Eddie Albert, again, the best comparison, I can, the, the most wide-known role of his was on Green Acres. He was the husband on Green Acres with, uh, 
the Gabor. I can't remember which was it. It wasn't Jaja. Um, Ava, and one of the Gabor, <laughs> one of the Gabor sisters. Oh, he stopped referencing things since you can't back up. Uh, anyway, he's fantastic in this, and this is not a comedic role. He's very intimidating. You want to know what else? Like he's. Let's see if I can find a shot. This is. This is Eddie Albert, okay? He was he was an older actor even by this time. There's several shirt off scenes in this movie, and he is jacked, man. He's in fit shape, super intimidating, uh, a man's man, man. And he he carries this movie. He is the reason to watch this movie. The plot: Audie Murphy is um, he runs a boat like off the coast of Florida. So again, probably Key West or Key Key Largo, whichever. <laughs> Whatever bogey movie I'm talking about, uh, he runs a boat, but the business isn't good. You know, he takes people out fishing, but it's not, it's it is what it is. It's paying the bills, but barely. And uh, Eddie Albert gets in the boat one day, and he's like, "I want you to take me. You know, let's let's go out." So they go out, and he's like, "Hey, what does it take to go to Cuba?" And he's like, "I'm not going to Cuba. There's trouble because it takes place during the uh, the Cuban Revolution." And he's like, I'm not going over there. There's trouble. So he's like, how much money would it take you to, to go over there? So because he's hungry for money and he's kind of, you know, not starving, but business isn't what it could be. He agrees to do it. So they end up going over to Cuba. And then lo and behold, Eddie Albert is a gun runner and he's got his own like scams going on. So now the good guy, Audie Murphy, is embroiled in this gun running cross, you know, cross uh, ocean scam this this crime thing that's going on so it's kind of noir in that element like a good man in over his head uh, it's a solid movie here's the thing i really like this movie not because audie murphy is so great in it his best work is westerns from the 50s like apache rifles um things like that but uh, uh no name on the bullet that's another good one but this is um later in the 50s and he like it's just not the best he's not the reason to watch this movie but the movie itself is really solid and it's got uh, a lot of style and it's really well directed. It's really quick. It really moves. This is 83 minutes long. You know, we're talking about like shorter movies. Like when you get older, you want shorter. This is perfect. 83 minutes. It says everything it has to say. No scene drags. It's not long enough for you to get bored. It's a fantastic pickup. It's maybe one of my favorites from the whole um the whole the whole haul. I don't know. That's tough though, because she was really good. You know what else was really good is the magic sword. This is a campy. Again, campy. You know, we're going to have to do an episode about camp. That's going to have to come sooner or later because I'm a big fan and a big champion of camp. And camp has come to be synonymous uh, with a negative quality. And I do not think that that's true. I think camp implies a certain level of knowledge, of inside knowledge, of familiarity, and of love, of homage. So The Magic Sword is a very campy, early 60s movie. It, it comes out of that fantasy... Um, you know, it kind of feels like a, uh, um, like a, you know, one of those Harryhausen special effects movies, but it's not. It does not have the budget of a Harryhausen special effects movie. Harryhausen's not in this. There's a dragon at the end of the movie, and it, I think it's a, literally a puppet, like a hand puppet. But it's a really well done puppet. I mean, here's the thing. Watch it for what it is. Don't watch it expecting Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings. They knew it was a puppet. That's part of the fun. It's part of the charm. And there's a lot of cool things in here. You know, it's got um, uh, Gary Lockwood, who when I, we did the Kino Lorber Hall, I was talking about Gary Lockwood. I was like, well, he's from Star Trek, that episode where no man has gone before. And then like people were like, well, he was in uh, a 2000 and a one. Uh, <laughs> oh, please. And I, like, I know, I know he was. He's in a ton of stuff, right? He had a long career. One of my favorite things that he was in is uh, it happened at the World's Fair with uh, Elvis, a one Elvis Presley, and a, and a young, I think it's Kurt Russell's first screen role. I could be wrong about if this is his first one, but he's, Kurt Russell, there's another video to be had about Kurt Russell and the Elvis connection, because Kurt Russell has brushed against Elvis like four times on screen over the years. It's really interesting. Anyway, I had a lot of fun with this, but this has a great commentary track by Tim Lucas, um, and uh, he really, <laughs> Tim Lucas literally wrote a book about Mario Bava, the Italian horror filmmaker, in addition to other genres, but he's famous for his horror. And uh, this movie doesn't really take place in the same realm as Bava, but <laughs> lo and behold, Tim Lucas manages to draw repeated connections to Mario Bava with his commentary. It's a really, it's one of those commentaries where you're just writing things down. You're like, I, I don't know this movie. I got to go seek this out. He's taking notes because it's, it's just like boom, 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 boom. Name, name, year, star, actor, producer, studio. And you're like, what? I, I, I don't know. That's my overwhelming. 
It's a little bit Columbo. It's a little bit Peter Peter Falk. You know, I, I can't help but notice that there's this movie, you know, you're talking about the magic sword. I understand. But there's also this movie Vibes from, uh, it's from Mill Creek Entertainment. And I'm in this movie. Peter Falk is in Vibes. This is a, I, okay. We talked about she, we talked about how I connected with her. We talked about good times and how I was like, Cher, I see you. This movie put Cindy Lauper back on my radar in a way that I cannot even explain to you. Like I have so fallen for Cindy Lauper. It's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I've always kn- I've grown up with the music of Cindy Lauper. Yeah, the Goonies are good enough. I know. Yeah, they're good enough. That's a cool song. Or like time after time. Oh yeah, like my name is Earl. He like he holds up the 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 jukebox. Yeah, like it's always been there. But this movie made me see her for the first time, maybe the first time ever, when you see past the career and you just see the person, you're like, whoa, what a, what a talent. She's fantastic, you guys. And I understand that this movie has kind of been dismissed. Look, it's not, by conventional means, it's not a great movie. It's not like it's this blockbuster. It's very quirky. It's not for everyone. But that's why I like it. It's so weird. And Cindy Lauper in this movie is so weird. But she's so wonderful, too. She's adorable. She's incredibly talented. She's sexy. Look at the cover of this movie, you guys. She has a four-octave range. So this movie has kind of spun me off down the Cindy Lauper rabbit hole. Here's the thing. I, I wrote I love this movie so much I wrote up a review for serial at midnight.com like as soon as I watched it. Like I watched it and I had to go write about it because it was just so on fire for it. And uh, it, it's it's I understand like a lot of people when I put that review out there, people were like, that movie's not good. Watch it again in the context of the sameness of the world today. When every mall looks like every other mall, when every blockbuster movie has the same score. We don't even have musical scores in movies now. We just have like tones and just like, and that's the musical score. There, There's something that to be said about breaking out of the mold. We live in such a homogenized uh, corporate mold now. And when you see something like this that comes along, listen, this was produced by Ron Howard, and you can tell that they just let the director make the movie he wanted to make. No one was involved. Like, it's all over the place. It's funny at times. It's creepy at times. Like, it's got weird magic stuff in it. It's bonkers. Just like she is bonkers. It's a bonkers movie. But I love bonkers movie or movies. And look at the art. Look at the artwork, the, the fonts of vibes. This movie makes me nostalgic for when I was a kid. See, I didn't see this movie when I was a kid. I didn't even know about it before Mill Creek released this on Blu-ray. So by the way, the only Blu-ray version of this that has ever existed, the only DVD version of this that ever existed was like a Martini Movies version or something, like a low-budget, very hard-to-find version. This is a huge service for the movie community. And it looks... It, it doesn't look fantastic, but it looks so much better than like a VHS or it's a solid HD presence. It's an aged but solid uh, HD presentation. And it just makes me nostalgic for my childhood in a way that I can't even explain. Just like this magic when I still believed in this kind of magic and that's kind of, you know, serial admitted. I'm trying to get back to that magic. All That's what all this is about is I'm trying to find that magic. And when I do find it, I try to share it with you guys. Some of that magic for me is in good times. A lot of that magic is in vibes. It just reminds me of a a happy, weird, quirky time when it was okay to be yourself and when you could look like Cyndi Lauper and be the main star in a movie with Jeff Goldblum, who himself is like super eccentric and not a conventional star. I don't know, you guys. I adore this movie. I absolutely love it. Please go read my full review at SerialAtMidnight.com. I've got screenshots. I've got the... You know what? This song... Th- this movie ends with the song Hole in My Heart that... Uh, it was a single kind of released to cross promote the movie. And then when the movie didn't do well, I think the song just kind of disappeared. It never ended up on an album, like one of her actual albums, an LP. <laughs> and uh, the music video, like I grew up watching MTV and VH1 nonstop. I never saw that music video. But seeing this movie and hearing that song at the end of the credits, I had to track it down. It's on one, It's on several, actually, of her greatest hits albums. But I've just been listening to it. And that video, the video is at the, in the in the review at serialatmidnight.com. So I had a blast with it. I, I adore the movie. When a Stranger Calls. You guys, this is another one that, like, it's been in the culture for so long that I kind of just take it for granted. I kind of just look past it. But watching it again for the first time in a long time, 
This movie's got a lot of power to it. Carol Kane is amazing in this movie. Um, and what I had kind of forgotten is that she shows up. It's, it's okay, so it's, um, this is the movie. You guys, if you haven't seen When a Stranger Calls, this is the movie that gives us the, now we would call it a meme, but we used to just call it a quote. <laughs> but it gives us the line, the call is coming from inside the house. That's where, that's, it's out of When a Stranger Calls. She's a babysitter at the beginning of the movie. She, you know, she, it's, it's like Scream. Wes Craven and Scream, the beginning of Scream with Drew Barrymore on the phone. That's him twisting. He's, he's homaging When a Stranger Calls and taking it to another place, which is what that whole movie is about. It's about homage, you know, respecting the sources, acknowledging the sources, and then twisting it for a new audience. Uh, and that's his take on When a Stranger Calls. She's a babysitter. She's being tortured on the phone by this guy who just keeps calling, calling, calling. He's scary. She, what I'd forgotten is that she's in the first 20 minutes of the movie and then she disappears for an hour of the movie and then she comes back for the last 20 minutes. She's very good. She holds her on. She's, uh, I really like Carol Kane quite a bit. Um, I, I've been working on a Carol Kane impression. I don't think that I'm going to do it because it's hard to, you have to find it. It's up here. And then there's like this, it's like this New York accent. No, see, that's like Jay Leno. That, eh, we're going to go out and talk about some cars, guys. What's going on with the cars? Uh, street walking with Jay, with, with Jay walking out here. So guys, you know who the president is? <laughs> Apologies. Uh, the weird thing about this movie is like Charles Durning is the male lead. Like he's the detective that's looking for the murderer. There's a, there's a murderer. Um, and he is so not who you would expect to be the detective. And he's like 75 pounds overweight. His shirt, his, like his clothes are too tight. He has a permanent grimace. I don't think we see him smile once in the movie. He's just like... <laughs> It's weird. It's just weird how movies have evolved. Like now, of course, you would never put a guy like that in a movie. You'd get Brad Pitt or you'd get, you know, some some jacked guy with a physical, you know, personal trainer and a personal chef, but not in these movies. And that's one of the reasons I like these movies because they represent a much more nuanced, balanced, real, real. That's the word I'm looking for. Just a very real and approachable version of, uh, of reality. And Charles Durning, you guys, he's so such a bizarre choice, but he kind of anchors this movie. I, don't, I really enjoyed this one as well. This was a great, uh, great to catch up with that movie again and to realize that it's it's so good. It's really good. It's a, I don't know if it's a horror movie. It's got elements of horror for sure. I think maybe it's more of a thriller. You know, the line is very thin when you get up between those two, the horror and thriller, and the, the line in between is very thin. And the line in between, is, it's very thin. It's Jay Leno, the line's very thin. And you say, I don't like to buy a lot of costs. Um, <laughs> okay, let's talk about No Mercy. This is also from Mill Creek Entertainment. By the way, the last two, I don't know that I said that. These are from Mill Creek Entertainment. Uh, they also put out Hudson Hawk, but I haven't had a chance to catch up with that one yet. No Mercy. Richard Gere, Kim Basinger, 1986. Um, I, I used to really like this movie, and I don't know. I, I didn't connect with it as well this time. It's, I, I think for me, you know, if you've listened to everything I've said during this video, I tend to champion a certain kind of movie that, um, that maybe is, it's got something of self-awareness to it. This movie is very intense and it's very, it's very serious. And I don't think the premise of the movie is Richard Gere is a cop and his partner has been murdered. Kim Basinger is the murderer's kind of like his mistress. Like she's, uh, it's kind of a prostitute that's on permanent retainer with this this guy. It's kind of creepy, and um, he's got like they get thrown in together, and he's got to protect her, and he's also got to get to the guy that killed his partner. And there's a lot of opportunity there for some fun and for some lighthearted stuff. It doesn't have to be a comedy, but it's so serious. It's so dire, and Richard Gere plays the whole thing so intensely serious he never just it, it but you know at the time it was probably considered smoldering smoldering richard gear uh kim basinger is very beautiful um the movie definitely plays into that there's a few things here that i don't really like there's a couple of scenes where richard gear hits kim basinger and not in real life it's in the movie like the character hits kim basinger's character and i know you know like we've come a long way in the last like since 1986 and it's bothered me because i don't think the movie thinks that that's a bad thing that that's that's i should say that like i don't think the movie presents that as a bad thing um but i don't know i don't even want to get into that really but i was like huh that's well that's weird it's also just a very visually dark movie like there's not a lot of color in it it's very gray uh, I think it takes place in Chicago, which, you know, like Chicago, uh, like nine months out of the year tends to be kind of gray. Um, 
And you know, it's not their fault. That's just uh, it's just the weather, man. You can't help it. That's just the way it goes. Uh, you got that sun there uh, between uh, June 15th and August the 12th. And you got to just get out there and enjoy it while you can there. Uh, the Kenosha Kickers. Anyway, um, it's 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 fine. I enjoy this movie fine. It, it, Richard, they're both very attractive. <laughs> they're incredibly attractive people. They use every opportunity they can to get both of them wet, like wet shirts sticking to muscles and bulges and all kinds of stuff. It's like, oh, okay, well, but I, I just wish that there was a little more humor to the movie, but there's not, you know, that's just what it is. That's the movie that it is. So uh, that's the one that I have, I really connected with the other two, with When a Stranger Calls and especially with Vibes. Also from Mill Creek Entertainment is, um, the Color of Magic and Hogfather, which are adaptations of Terry Pratchett. Now, Terry Pratchett is a great, he has passed, but he was a great uh, fantasy, like comedic fantasy writer in the vein of a Douglas Adams. Um, and if you, like, by that comparison, you know, they've adapted Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams for, like, every medium that exists, including, like, a CD-ROM game. And... For these particular adaptations, Terry Pratchett said, you know, if I'd meant for them to be written for the screen, I would have written them differently. I wrote them for the page. And you feel that. There is a loss there. Because while they do retain a lot of the quirk and a lot of the winking humor, and is like it's it's actually kind of remarkable how much of the the the, the author's voice they're able to put into these into these miniseries. Is, is, is. But there is something missing because it's not like go read Terry Pratchett. This is a great jumping off point to get into these stories and then go read Terry Pratchett because a movie, a miniseries can never do justice to what the he had a way with words. He had a way of describing things and of playing with words and of using he was it's like meta like it was so like he'd used the words and then he would call back to a word later and he'd be like, wow, and it only works in print. Um, so these are cool for what they are. I've enjoyed them. They're like, like the two of these together. It's like six and a half hours. Tim Curry is in the color of magic. Um, so it's, it's been fun to see them, but it did make me just want to go read Terry Pratchett. And that's, but you know what? That's a compliment though. You just want to go read Terry Pratchett. So on that note, job well done. Uh, these last two come from dark force entertainment. And uh, I kind of swore off Dark Force for between six months and a year because they are, so they're a boutique label. They're kind of affiliated with Code Red. And uh, um, yeah, I don't even know how much I want to get into. They kind of go at it with their fan base. They kind of antagonize them. They kind of, uh, not kind of, they do. There's, they're very aggressive. With, so I'm going to steer away from some of this. But there have been some practices behind the scenes that, did not feel very professional and kind of turned me off of the product because I'm not interested in arguing or debating with anybody online about like the merits of a transfer and I'm not going to I like I don't do that that's not my interest I just want to see the movies the best way that I can but they tend to have they in the past they have really gone after their fan base and uh, they encourage like you know buying multiple copies on eBay and stuff like that. It's, I think they've moved away from a lot of that but if you ask any person who's still aware of the whole dark force scene, um, it could be better. It could be more professional, but they've kind of allied recently with MVD, who I'm a big fan of. Uh, the people at MVD are really cool. And I think with that distribution deal in place, some of that stuff may be kind of in the past now. We'll see what happens. But I grabbed Mirror Mirror, which is a 1990 horror movie. Um, and it's uh, the, the interesting thing about this movie is that the star is named Rainbow Harvest. And she is, you guys... The spitting image of Winona Ryder. I mean, like, it's uncanny. And here's the thing. She made several movies. She doesn't have a huge IMDb credits list. Uh, it's like eight credits or something like that. She was in an episode of Miami Vice, which we have on Blu-ray, thanks to Mill Creek. Um, a, a select number of titles that she was in, she, movies that she was in. And then she just left. She just walked away from Hollywood. She walked away from acting. No one knows where she is. No one. She might be the dentist, uh, other receptionist at a dentist's office. No one has any idea. She might just be happily retired in the suburbs, raising children, because you know this was thirty years ago. So I don't know. But uh, I'm telling you guys, I don't want to say she's like a one to one for an one on a rider, but they could be sisters for sure. It's like. I don't, and I don't mean that to degrade anything about her, but I think that was maybe part of the charm is that Winona Ryder was becoming a huge star, Beetlejuice and all the way up to like reality bites and stuff like that. That period, like 89 to 92, somewhere in there, 88 maybe. Um, and I think that maybe that got her some roles in some of these movies. So this is a horror movie 
with like a, you know, it's an evil mirror. Uh, who cares, right? What's the point? We don't watch a movie like this for plot. There's an evil mirror with like a demon in it or something, and it slowly starts to take this girl over. She comes to town with her mom, who's played by Karen Black, the great Karen Black uh, trilogy of terror. And the mirror, she's super goth. She's so cool though. That's the thing. Like I don't want her to change because she's pretty cool as she is. But the mirror starts to like take her over and draw her out of her shell and make her like more aggressive and. It's uh, it's very interesting, but it, it's it's for what it is for a 1990 horror movie, a low budget horror movie. It's pretty cool. I'm glad I picked it up. Uh, and then the last one, you guys, this is the last review in the hall. Uh, Ator, the Fighting Eagle, also from Dark Force Entertainment. This is in conjunction with Code Red. These guys only distribute on the internet, as far as I know. Um, so that's, you know, when we talk about new releases that come out and like, it doesn't really matter what's showing up at Target or Walmart because there's so much that's not, and that probably never will. You can't judge the overall health of a, of a medium on what you see at Walmart or Target. This movie is pretty cool. This is a 1982, uh, sword and sorcery movie. It's low budget. It's an Italian exploitation movie. It's directed by Joe D'Amato. Uh, and I think it's directed by Joe D'Amato. Yeah. Uh, yep, shock director Joe D'Amato, uh, uh, and it is absolutely chasing Conan the Barbarian. It's trying to cash in on Conan. So many movies did that at this time. I'm thinking about Yor, The Hunter from the Future. So many movies from that, that early 80s thing, Chasing Sword and Sorcery. Sword and Sorcerer, we talked about that's one of our most anticipated, we, they're one of our five movies that we want the most on Blu-rays, The Sword and the Sorcerer. This is kind of like that, but much, much, much lower budget. You guys, this is like a drive-in movie. Super, super cheap. Done on the done on the cheap. But it's got cool locations. It's got cool costumes. Miles O'Keefe is the uh, the main character. And I mean, it never these movies never live up to the promise of the cover, but that's a pretty cool cover. Like there's a scene towards the end of the movie where Ator has to fight this there's this giant spider and it's it's a puppet like it's but it's in like they built this full-size prop and it can't really move because it's just like wires and stuff but you like you got to give these guys credit for trying to make the most bang out of the smallest buck that they had i just love that i love the i love the audacity of it i love the um you know go like going back to color out of space i champion it for giving it a shot you got to take a shot they'll do the same old thing give it a shot so this is this was a lot of fun i think there's four maybe there's more than that there's four or five a tour movies uh there the third one uh iron sword and i can't remember the name of it. the third one is also on blu-ray from scorpion from scorpion releasing but i think the other two MIA. We don't have them in high definition, but hopefully we can get them. Guys, that is the haul. That is the that is 16 reviews, 16 opinions. And uh, th look, this is a longer video. I would like some feedback if you've made it to the end of this video. I would love to know what you think about this. This is in terms of like a YouTube um, creator's... This is kind of a gamble because every analytic will tell you shorter, faster, the better. Hey, YouTube people don't have an attention span. You have them for like two and a half minutes. So if I put up something that's like 50 minutes long or longer than that, and I can retain an audience, that says that YouTube, that that's not right. That I don't have to make content that YouTube thinks appeals to the masses, that, uh, that you care about, you care about the voice, you care about opinions, you care about integrity, you care about, you know, what do we think about this stuff? And that's the whole premise for this video is like, well, we bought it. Now, what do we think about it? And all of YouTube's convention, like all the marketing, all the, all the, uh, the advice that they give to the creators, that's really it's like get in and get out as quick as you can. Um, this goes directly against all of that. And I kind of want to see how it's going to play. So this is an experiment. If you like stuff like this, please let us know. Uh, and again, consider please supporting us on Patreon because we have hours upon hours upon hours of things just like this on uh, on Patreon. And um, that's why they're on Patreon. It's because conventional wisdom says, hey, it's not going to work on, on the main YouTube channel. So let us know what you think. And uh, again, support the creators that you care about because it, it really does. A dollar makes a huge difference. You'd be surprised um, what uh, what what a difference that can make in the, in the life of a creator as they try to you know, spend the hours and the hours and the hours to edit this stuff and to do the best that they can to put this stuff up and make it look and connect as well as it can. All right, guys, I'm rambling. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I appreciate you. Take care. What are you watching? What do you think about what you're watching? Let's continue the conversation in the comments below, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Until next time, I will catch you later.